Thank you, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, I will say I feel kind of nervous falling for Both. Uh, I've <clears throat> I'll say that I have his book on API security sitting on my desk, and uh, quite frequently I'll have it open, and my teammates will say, oh, "It must be something serious. He's got the book open again." <laughs> uh, but as I said, I'm Greg Streetman. I'm a senior engineer with Eagle Technology Group. We do consulting mostly in the U.S. government space. And I'm going to talk about a, one of our clients needed a custom federated authenticator. And I'm going to talk about our implementation of that and talk about how WSO2, you know, how we uh, did that within WSO2. The first question is why a custom authenticator? I mean, you've seen with WSO2, there's a lot of capability built in. Uh, but in our case, our client already had a custom enterprise-wide authentication system that did their authentication for them. They had a lot of stovepipe applications that had already been built using this one system. And it was not going to be a quick migration away from it. Uh, <clears throat> now, our customer had already told us you're going to work with the WSO2 ESP environment. You're going to be using this. And our first step was, statement was, OK, what is WSO2? <laughs> uh, since then, we've uh, started with ESP. And we realized fairly soon that we're going to need identity management, API management, uh, business activity management. We've added in several different portions of it and are now looking at uh, business rules engine and uh, business process management also for different clients out there. Uh, but in fact, we, we uh, got so excited about the uh, WSO2 product and what all it can do for us that we became a partner with WSO2. And we decided that one of the goals was we need to be able to migrate to a WSO2 identity solution. Now, I can't give you the details of our client's security system, uh, but I will summarize it by saying we did they did a X509 certificate SSL handshake to get the client and server handshake, get the client's information, and would then send back a globally unique ID, which we could use to get claims information about that user from their identity manager. Uh, I'm also stealing slides. I know that they talked about stealing slides at the keynote today. Uh, this is a page right out of the uh, documentation for Identity Server. And I wanted to bring this up because it shows all the different capabilities that are in there. Uh, you have service providers that use inbound authentication. The authentication framework is kind of the key in between all of this. Uh, authenticators and, of course, ID identity providers. You have a provisioning framework. And as you mentioned, there's a lot of capability to plug in different user store managers. You can use LDAP, you can use Active Directory, or you can have a JDBC driver. Or if you want to roll your own, you can roll your own in just about any of these areas in here. Uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit. I know you've all heard that uh, WSO2 is carbon-based with OSGI. Uh, I have kind of my own analogy of that. That's kind of like a Swiss Army knife. <laughs> You can have a few tools. You can have a lot of tools. You can customize it. Uh, you can have it built just like you want to do what you want it to do. Now, Carbon is kind of the framework that, that's the knife itself. And OSGI is the tool, tooling that lets you add new tools and change them out. Uh, then, as I was kind of going along this same thought line, I thought, you know, what would happen if you put everything that WSO2 has out in one, one tool out there? I think it looks something kind of like this. <laughs> it'd do a lot of things, but it'd be hard to use. Just like if you put everything into WSO2 at one point, it'd do a lot of things, but it'd be hard to use. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how the identity flow happens to begin with. Uh, you have service providers. I think it's already been mentioned in other talks that service providers are anything out there that provide services that need authentication. So you, know, you can have a lot of different service providers out here that go in and uh, authenticate in different ways. 
So these service providers call into the inbound authentication. And we saw on that slide before you have things such as SAML SSO, OAuth, uh, passive STS, all these inbound authentication methods are available to you. And that calls into the authentication framework, which then looks up what identity provider is associated with that service provider, calls that identity provider, and here we call local and federated authenticators. So where, we, where we're plugging in at is just in the local and federated authenticator. The thing that says, are you who you are, and here's the information about you. I'm going to talk about the flow a little bit more. I know it was mentioned about claims. I'm going to talk a little bit more about claims and claims mapping here. So the service provider calls into the inbound authentication, and it may say, I need to know this information about the user. I need these claims. And service providers talk in their dialect to the authentication framework, and the authentication framework maps this to a local claims mapping. We're going to talk a little bit about, more about this in just a moment. But then they look up the identity provider that's needed, and they map from that local to the identity provider's claim mapping so that if your identity provider uses its own dialect or its own information out there, it can talk in its own dialect. Kind of like a Google Translate or something. <clears throat> so then it goes to the identity provider, which passes it to the authenticator. The authentication happens, and it comes back into this authentication framework where that information is then... Uh, map back to a local claim mapping. Now at this point there's a feature out there called just-in-time provisioning which we used which takes the user's information and puts it in WSO2's data store. Kind of another way of getting around the problem that you mentioned of how to migrate our users because we're going to be using their authentication as part of the migration time frame. Every time the user, a user logs in we grab that user's information and put it in the data store. If it's already there, we'll update it. If it's not, it adds it. Uh, if it's already there and ha hasn't changed, it just goes on. But that's a really nice feature of, of the identity manager. And I keep saying identity manager. Uh, almost all the features in the identity manager are also available in the API manager. So our authenticator is actually running both in uh, our identity provide server and in our API manager. We do the authentication in both places. And finally, that local mapping is mapped back to the service provider's dialect and sent back to the service provider. So we talked a lot about claims mapping and claims management. So, you know, just have a screenshot captured from WSO2 uh, and we have, you'll see that there are six default claims ma by default that are already mapped and claimed. You can, add ma you can add claims, you can modify claims dialects to add your own information in there. If, you, if the claims ma dialect you're using doesn't have the information you need, you can add that in. You may have to add it also into your LDAP's data store so it knows about that attribute too. Talk about how this kind of works together. I have a couple of claims mapping detail screens captured here. One is from the WSO2 org claims mapping dialect, and it's the last name. The other is from Act Schema org, and it's uh, name person slash last. Both of these attributes, both of these claims URIs map to the same attribute called SN. So these, what would happen is it would map to the local mapped attribute and then map back out based on that mapped attribute. So because these have the same mapped attribute, they would map back and forth between the claims. Bringing this slide back up again, uh, just want to focus on the authenticators a little bit here. Uh, you have local authentication. Local authentication happens in the 
uh, resident identity provider that comes up by default in I identity server. You have username and password. Username and password, if you don't know that, also will handle an X509 certificate cert login. It will match up with the user ID based on your uh, CN and the uh, certificate. Uh, so eventually we can go and just use that, but because we needed to uh, keep the identity that was already in the other system, we weren't able to use that just yet. You also have integrated Windows authentication, which allows you to you know, link up with your Active Directory direct straight through. Then there are federated authenticators. To use a federated authenticator, you create an identity provider and set it up to use that federated authenticator. Now then, it's easy to think of federated authenticators as external, but you could actually be doing the authentication still on that same box, but it's just a, uh, it's not uh, considered local. It's going out to some other service. Uh, federated authenticators, you have OpenID, OpenID Connect, OAuth, SAML SSO, passive uh, SAML token service, Facebook, Yahoo, Google, Microsoft. Like I said, there's a lot of capability built in, and with the new version, they're going to be coming up with more capability. Uh, that FIDO. Uh, so most people probably won't have a need for a custom authenticator. But if you do, it's there, and it gives you a lot of flexibility. So now let's go about into how we implement a custom authenticator. Uh, the first thing you have to do is you have to inter implement an interface of type application authenticator. And application authenticator is extended by two other authenticators, local application authenticator and federated application authenticator which just simply states, is it a local, does it go in that local group or does it go in the federated group when I group them in? The application authenticator provides, uh, exposes six methods. Uh, the first one can handle, I'm gonna come back to here in just a moment. We'll talk about that on the next slide. The process method is called every time you want to process an authentication request. Uh, the other ones are support. You have get name, get friendly name. That's the name of the authenticator and a display name of the authenticator. So you can, you know, you can't put spaces in the regular name. You have to have, uh, so let's give it a friendly name. So when you display it on the screen, it looks better. Claim dialect, we've already kind of talked about the claims dialect. So. And then you can get configuration properties. Take a moment to talk about authentication patterns for just a moment, uh, kind of preparation for the next slide. But normally when you authenticate, and you know, this is not the only two patterns. There's multi-phase, there's multi-factor authentication, multi-step that you could go through. But in a authenticator, typically you're doing one of two things. Either the request already has all the information you need. It might be a basic authentication and you have the authorization header with username and password in there. Uh, but it has everything you need. All you have to do is process it give the identity and send back the response. Uh, but oftentimes what we do is we redirect to another page. Uh, login page out there where you collect the username and password. If you use the Facebook authenticator, it will send you to Facebook's login page. In our case, we were sending to a login page for uh, our, you know, our home-built uh, authentication package that did a X509 handshake, grabbed the user's information, uh, and sent back a, a globally unique ID that we could then use a SOAP call to get the claims information about the user. So it was that two-phase uh, authentication pattern with a redirect and then processing. 
And I bring that up because the next thing that the uh, authentication framework provides for us is an abstract application authenticator, which extends application authenticator and provides some of the function we need to begin with. The first function it provides, it provides a get claim dialect URI, which returns no. It works. You may want to change that, but it will work uh, to get started. It provides a basic get configuration properties function, which returns an empty set of properties unless properties have been set. It actually will check and see if properties have been set uh, externally. If not, it will return an empty set. Uh, then it provides the process function. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not going to actually process your authentication and handle everything for you, but it handles that, uh, those two authentication patterns. This is where the can handle function that we talked about in the uh, interface comes in. Uh, the uh, process function calls your can handle function. If it returns false, I can't handle it, so I'll redirect. I'll do the initiate, initiate authentication request. If can handle returns true, it does the process authentication response. Now this is for a login request. It also handles logout requests. So there's an initiate logout request and log process logout response also defined. These are abstract functions that have to be implemented. Uh, so you know, we have these functions. I'm not going to talk about logout request and response. Uh, very similar to the authentic to the uh, login request and response. We're not going to talk about those. Our can handle function simply looks to see if that globally unique ID is, passes a parameter in the call. If not, we redirect. We call the initiate. And if it does, we call process. So let's look at the initiate and process functions. The main thing we do in the initiate is we do a redirect. We're going to redirect to our server. But there's one important thing we have to do here. We're going to set a session variable called session context identifier. And we're also going to add that to uh, the call that we send to our authenticator, our authentication server, so that when it redirects it, sends that identifier back with it also. This makes sure that our response is matched up to the original authentication request so that uh, we don't lose, it, it knows which request it's re handling when it gets the response. Uh, the process function that's provided for you automatically links those two together for you once you've done that. The process function is fairly simple. You just process your user information. So let's talk about how we set the user information. The process function, and then in turn your uh, process login res response function gets an object called context by default. You can call it whatever you want. But it is your message context, your authentication context. And what you're going to do is you're going to set the subject of that, context.set subject, to whatever your user identifier is, whatever you define that user to be. And then you set the subject attributes, set subject attributes, to the claims information you get back from your server. This is the way you can set all the attributes that you want to know about this user. Now, to get those claim attributes set up, you're going to create a map of an object called claim mapping. That's going to be your key. And the value is just a string. Now, claim mapping has four attributes. The first is your remote claim URI. That's what, what the remote claim is on uh, your <coughs> authenticator. Then the local claim URI is the uh, claim URI defined by the identity provider. Then you have a default value. You can 
set it, you know, so that if you don't have anything set, it will let, create a default value. And there's a field, whether that field has been requested or not. Uh, if the, technically, if the service provider originally requested that, we should be filling that field in as is requested. In my case, uh, I'm not having the service provider send in any requested claims, so I just leave that as false. Okay, so that's pretty much all there is to the code. It's, once you've got it together, it's fairly simple to build an authenticator out there. What we have to do now is deploy it. As I said earlier, OSGI is what allows us to add new tools into our Swiss Army knife. I, I kind of like that uh, analogy, so I continue using it. To create an OSGI bundle, what you're really doing is creating entries in, a man, in the manifest.mf file in that jar file that's part of that class, jar. Uh, you can write one up and just have it automatically go over. But I prefer to use Maven to build these plugin, to build the, this manifest MF file. Uh, there's two plugins available that I'm aware of. I'm sure there's probably more. Both of the ones I'm aware of are part of the Apache Felix project. The first one is a maven-scr-plugin. This one uses annotations in the Java code to determine uh, what your uh, activator is, what packages to uh, export, what packages uh, you need to import, and it handles all that for you. But you have to get those annotations right. The second one is Maven Bundle Plugin. This one allows you to configure all that information within the Palm Maven Palm file as part of the configuration attributes. Uh, I use the Maven Bundle plugin because that was the one I could figure out fastest and it was easiest to use. Uh, sometimes speed is uh, just as good as uh, trying to dig into things even more. Uh, so we're going to talk about that Maven Bundle plugin and then we're going to talk about activating the OSGI uh, once it's loaded. Uh, so the bundle plugin, uh, as I said, its group ID is Org Apache Felix, and it's just the Maven bundle plugin. Uh, you're going to yes, you're going to set your uh, bundle activator, which is how you're going to activate your code, uh, and what you're going to import and export. So in the activator. Uh, I use an activator that implements bundle activator, which is an OSGI component, you know, class that's out, well, interface that's out there, that basically introduces a stop and start function. Quite frequently, you won't have to do anything in stop if you have to clean up anything at the end of the session. If you've opened up any, uh, anything, you have to close it, fine. Uh, but we didn't have to. The start function you create a instance of your object, of your class, and then you register it. If you don't register it with Application Authenticator, nothing will know about it. It'll be available as a class out there, but will never work. So that activation is very key to this. <laughs> so deploying the code, you know, as I said, this is an OSGI bundle. So we drop it in the repository components drop-ins directory. Drop it in, restart the server, it's going to deploy it as an OSGI component, get things working. Interesting thing, if you have a non-OSGI bundle, maybe you have a jar file that has supporting files, or even when you drop a JDBC jar file for, you know, to access your da different databases within WSO2, you're dropping that into the plugins directory. Uh, what happens then is that WSO2 is going to take that, it's going to modify the manifest MF file to export every package that's in there, doesn't need to import anything because they were activated, and it's going to drop it into the drop-ins directory and then deploy it. Uh, just kind of interesting to know that that's what's happening in the background. Also, that's why you, if you drop something in plugins, why you'll see it also in drop-ins directory. And of course, you restart the server and it runs for you. 
Uh, so this is our federated authenticator screen before deploying with all your standard things. After deploying, your authenticator will show up uh, with the capability to enable and default. And <coughs> you, to configure my authenticator, uh, there's a file under, also under repository conf, security, application authentic authentication XML. Uh, this has some authenticator config tags. Uh, we create a new ta another tag in there that has a name of our authenticator enabled, whether the object is enabled or not. And then uh, any parameter tags we want. And then we load that in the constructor. We use a uh, file-based authentication builder. Once that reads in that file and processes it for you, we can get our authentication being by name, name of our authenticator, because we had the name attribute. Uh, I have checked to see if that attribute is enabled. If it is, then I reg in my activator uh, register it. If it's not activated, I don't register it. That way, if I can, I can put in my configuration, it doesn't show up anymore. And then any properties that are in there is in a, you get from a get properties map function. Sorry, I'm kind of going through this quickly. I'm running out of time. But. So in summary, we are able to integrate between WSO2 and our customer's legacy authentication. Uh, we saw no noticeable impact on performance by implementing this extra authentication. And with just-in-time provisioning, we're able to migrate the data into WSO2 for later use 